Good morning. Uh, just for those of you who are joining the second part of our, uh, of our conference, my name is Heather Conley. I'm Senior Fellow and Director here at the Europe Program uh, for, at CSIS. For the last several days, um, we have brought together an extraordinary group of Europeans and Americans, and we've taken them to beautiful colonial Williamsburg, Virginia, for several days of very focused conversation about the future of Europe and using the American historical experience uh, and the creation of our union, our work in progress. So as we looked at the concept of having Europe become an ever closer union and the elements of that ever closer union, the economic pillar, democracy, leadership, how do you, how do you create a more perfect union? And we realize both our unions are not very perfect in, in many ways, but there's some enduring qualities. And so uh, through the generosity of the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation and the College of William and Mary, uh, CSIS joined and brought these thought leaders together. So what we're going to do for the next hour and a half is give you, I wish you could have been with us for those three extraordinary days, but we're going to give you a flavor for some of the themes, some of the, the conversation that we had about the future of the European Union. And as our first uh, discussion with our, our, our journalist colleagues gave you a flavor for, the state of the European Union um, is, is, is a strong union, but it's been tested severely over the last five years of economic crisis. We had a, a our, our framework for this discussion was if you think of the European Union as a house that was under you know half construction uh, of a of an economic union, and then the crisis thrust upon it, it's been trying to build the house, weather the storm maybe enlarge the house uh, if we think about Ukraine and expanding European integration, but there are some real challenges before Europe. And for the United States, a strong Europe is absolutely essential, certainly before the crisis in Ukraine, now more so than ever. And sometimes there's an under, well, no, not sometimes, there is a constant underappreciation uh, in the United States uh, for how Europe is evolving and transforming, but, but facing some severe headwinds economically, politically, and democratically. So as I said, I've been in my Williamsburg nirvana uh, and, uh, and with our journalist colleagues, and you got that sense. Now we have our, our uh, foreign policy heavy hitters uh, and, and thought leaders who have really looked at the expanse of, of transatlantic issues, European issues. And so let me just very briefly introduce uh, my colleagues, I'm gonna let them give you some of the, their own reflections about the state of the European Union, perhaps reflect on the upcoming European Parliament elections and what that means for the future of Europe. And then again, we will, we will welcome you into uh, having some, some questions uh, and, and some dialogue as, as we finish. Uh, we are very delighted and honored to have uh, Francois Heisborg with us. Francois is chairman of the Council of the Geneva Center for Security Policy, and he's also chairman of uh, the London-based um, International Institute for Strategic Studies. Uh, Francois has written a new book, and I hope he shares a little bit about this new book uh, that's out uh, about uh, a European dream that maybe is a different dream than what you originally had. Um, and, and then we're going to turn to Ulrike Guerreau. Ulrike is senior fellow at the Open Society Institute for Europe. Uh, she's uh, based in Berlin, but has been uh, a thought leader in understanding the construction of Europe. Uh, and Ulrike will provide us with her perspective. And then finishing up is uh, my dear friend and colleague, and I would say mentor in this job, uh, John Kornblum is a CSIS senior advisor whom I rely on greatly and heavily uh, to help me understand Europe. John is the former Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs, former U.S. Ambassador to, Bel to Berlin, to the OSCE. Um, he is timeless and he is ageless, but he has been at, the, uh, at some very critical moments uh, in the formation of the transatlantic relationship that, again, I hope he will share some of those reflections. So with that, Francois, over to you. Well, th thank you very much, Heather. It's, uh, it's really been great uh, participating in these, uh, these meetings. Uh, 
Uh, I feel a little bit like Boris Yeltsin uh, uh, when he was asked at a press conference uh, in Istanbul uh, when he was president, what is the situation of Russia today? And uh, Boris Yeltsin uh, 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 said, well, do you, uh, do you want the, the short answer first or the long answer first? The journalist says, uh, I guess the short answer first. And Yeltsin says, situation good. What is the long answer? Long answer is not good. Uh, <coughs> that's, one, that's one way of introducing the topic. But there's another, there's another way of introducing the topic of the State of the Union. It also happens to take place in Istanbul. And that's a, a speech which uh, the Prince of Darkness, Richard Pearl, uh, gave uh, some 12 or 13 years ago. And uh, uh, a meeting organized by Turks, a Turkish foreign minister, and etc. Uh, and Richard was going on about uh, how hopeless, feckless, spineless uh, the Europeans were, and that you know, the European Union was a complete, you know, complete wreck. There's nothing, nothing good to be said about it. And then he, then he said. Uh, Oh yes, and it is unacceptable that they will not accept you, Turkey, into their ranks. And then, of course, came my turn to speak, and I said, well, there's a bit of a problem here, you know. If we are really as spineless, hopeless, feckless as has been painted, uh, uh, it is a strange friend who would want to urge you Turks to enter uh, that particular community. So you can't have it both ways. Uh, but the fact is, well, first of all, we've never had a strong union, Heather. We may have had a strong Europe, but we never had a strong union. I mean, a strong union is the United States of America, constitution. Uh, as uh, one of our participants, Professor Wood, reminded us, the European Union looks more like the US at the time of the Articles of Confederation. That is a weak union, not a strong union. And that's not a critique, just a statement of fact. Uh, and therefore, it is not a strategic animal. This was already stated earlier on. When it does strategic stuff, it tends to do it uh, 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 inadvertently. And this is to a large extent what happened in the run-up uh, to the events in the, in the Maidan. Uh, secondly, it doesn't have a demos. It doesn't have a, pe a people whose primary identity is European. The primary seat of identity remains national. Uh, here again, this is, uh, uh, this is a statement of reality, uh, not an expression of uh, uh, some sort of uh, hidden wish. Uh, thirdly, uh, the situation, uh, sorry, the third, third thing is that progress towards a closer union has not happened recently. The last time we tried to do a great big push was with the European Constitution in 2005. We had a convention, I think, you know, and the comparison, the analogy with the US was quite deliberate at the time, had a, con a constitutional convention to produce a constitution. Constitution was not passed. It wasn't so much the content per se, because uh, it actually wasn't terribly federal as a constitution, but the fact is that people in France and the Netherlands, two of the six founding states of the European Union, were not ready to go into constitutional mode. And that's, that's, that was the situation. What I've just described, describes the European Union as it was 10 years ago, as it does today. But in the interval, bad things have happened. It's been further weakened. First of all, the European dream has been crowded out by the nightmare of the policies which have had to be undertaken to save the Euro project. This is what my book is about. That is, I consider it as a real risk that these policies are rebounding, not against the Euro per se. People are actually quite happy with the Euro as an instrumentality, uh, but against the European Union, where the trend in the opinion polls over the last, uh, uh, the, the Pew opinion polls in particular, uh, since the beginning of the crisis, all go in the same direction. 
in about the same proportions in every country where the poll has been taken, except in the United Kingdom, where the, pretend, where the percentages were so low that if they went any lower, they would have struck oil. Uh, uh, but everywhere else, it's been downwards. Uh, secondly, uh, we have run out of money, uh, notably for defense. We'll come back to that. Uh, thirdly, we have no growth. That's not, obviously not good. The last six years, Eurozone aggregate, 0% growth. Uh, lost production can be counted in the hundreds of billions of euro, if not uh, up to a trillion euro over that period. That is a lot of money. Uh, relations within the European Union have become worse. We have the north-south divide, we have the cooling of the French-German couple, uh, not to mention the cooling of significant relations between specific members of the European Union and other significant countries. The German-American relationship was talked about. Uh, even worse, the four freedoms, which, which are really the European Union's uh, uh, DNA, uh, uh, the four freedoms, freedom of movement of people, freedom of movement of goods, freedom of movement of capital, freedom of movement of services, these are being severely challenged within the Union. So all of this looks pretty bloody bad. Uh, and it looks even worse if we look at where we stood 15 years ago. Because at the time, we had the ambition of going constitutional, we were on the verge of launching the Great Euro Project, which was supposed to bring growth, stability, and convergence, which has done exactly the opposite. We were on the verge of launching a European security and defense policy. So when you look back 50, you stuck back 15 years and say, oh, God, this is, uh, this is awful. But back to Richard Pearl in Istanbul, and uh, however, the Union deserves to be defended, and it deserves to not only to live on, but it deserves to progress if and when conditions are politically ready. Uh, I'm sure uh, uh, Ulrike, for example, will tell us about how public opinion is actually not as adverse to federal solutions as they sometimes said. But for the moment, politicians know on which side their bread is buttered. They know that if they come up with anything which looks like ever closer union, they will be shot. And so at the current and at the oncoming European elections in the month of May, there is on offer no overt federalist agenda in any political party in any European country. Uh, that is obviously bad. And yet, and yet, look, let's look back again 15 years. The Kantian Garden, Bob Kagan's formula. And Bob Kagan was actually a lot more careful in talking about the Kantian Garden than the title of his book would suggest. In his book itself, he's quite, he's quite nuanced. Uh, that is a fantastic accomplishment. We have defused the sources of conflict and enmity not simply between the Western countries of the Union, Franco-German reconciliation and all of that, but also between the Eastern members of the Union. Think Hungary and its neighbors, with significant Hungarian minorities. Think Poland. You know, this is absolutely remarkable. And this, is, and this by the way, was not backward looking. This was not the narrative of we are awful people and we have to uh, build our own straitjacket so that we are not going to uh, get at each other's throats again in the future. Uh, this, is, this is actually not the way the pacification of Europe occurred during the last few decades and notably through the great wave of enlargement which made the European continent whole and free uh, during the last uh, 10 years, uh, the enlargement of 2004. Uh, secondly, the single market, it works. 
Whether you're a member of the Eurozone or whether you're not a member of the Eurozone, the single market works. Uh, uh, and although I said that the four freedoms were challenged, they may be challenged, but apart from in a non-EU country, which is Switzerland, the challenge has not materialized, I touch wood and hope it won't materialize, in a practical political form yet. So not only is the European Union, uh, uh, does it deserve to live and to prosper, if only if one looks back at the track record of enlargement, uh, but it deserves uh, to uh, uh, enter into uh, step changes in the future, get back to the ever closer union. But that's not going to happen soon. What is going to happen soon? Where do we go next? First, we're going to have the elections in May. That is very interesting. There will be plenty of shocks in the election. The National Front may become the number one party in what will be essentially a protest vote in France. Ditto with Gerd de Wilder's anti-European party in the Netherlands. And UKIP in the UK may well be number two, uh, anti-EU uh, party. Uh, but, although this is not going to look good, the fact is that the, for the first time, we're going to have a European election where people are going to vote as if it were a real election as if they were real stakes. And that in itself is positive. Uh, 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 the extremist parties are awful, but they will have had one virtue, and that is to actually force some sort of discussion of what Europe is about. So that's the first step. Second step, we're going to do the recasting of who does what within the European Union. Commission, High Representative for Foreign Security Affairs, and so on. Uh, that casting, hopefully, will be good. I immediately add, if you, know, if you ask me, do I think it will be good, I will, I will say, honestly, it doesn't look good for the moment. Uh, it still looks as if the next head of the commission is going to be yet another uh, politician who, having lost an election in his, in, his nation, in his own country, or is no longer eligible in his own country, is going to, be, or is going to serve as a retread uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the commission. Doesn't look good, but we'll see. Uh, and uh, I think there are good hopes that we, we may, now that we have tested and actually seen work, the Office of the High Representative and the External Action Service, and there have been real accomplishments with Kosovo and Serbia reconciling, uh, and uh, the part taken in the Iran uh, nuclear negotiations. Uh, if you, you, we probably can now actually put a high-powered individual at the head of that office. And that could, that could also uh, bring a lot of improvement. Thirdly, we have to restore growth. That is the precondition for anything good to happen in terms of the development of the strengthening of the, of the European Union. And to restore growth, well, what we do know is that the current policies do not restore growth. Uh, I have my own suggestions in, in my book, which are ab uh, essentially about removing the straitjacket of the euro for those countries who suffer the most under it object of debate and discussion, and we discussed it a lot at Williamsburg. Uh, but whatever one may think about the future of the euro, we may have to do something in any case which will look like Abenomics. You know, when people tell me, oh, Italy has a much too high debt to be able to, uh, to find growth again. Well, Italy has a debt which is, in t percentage terms of GDP, 90% lower than that of Japan. Japan is 220. Italy is 135. Uh, anybody who tells me that uh, therefore Japan can grow and Italy cannot will not meet with a good reception from me. Now, maybe Abenomics won't work, but it's certainly worth a try. Uh, and it certainly looks as if Mr. Renzi in Italy uh, is thinking pretty much along those sorts of lines. Uh, so we're not going to get to the sunny uplands 
to speak uh, in, Churchillian, uh, in Churchillian mode. We're not going to get to the sunny uplands anytime soon, but there are things that we can do to pull ourselves out of the mire of the last six years. Uh, there are things that we can do to change our fortunes. Don't count us out. But at the same time, of course, do not expect of the Union to be something that it is not and will not be for a very long time. It is not and will not be a strategic animal. Member states will continue, as is the case for NATO. We all know that NATO is not a strategic animal because, as we pointed out earlier on, it's the member states who decide to do something and do it under the NATO flag. The European Union is pretty much the same. Uh, uh, and don't beat up on the Union because it bumbles into strategic mode without realizing what it does. It's simply not equipped uh, to uh, make those sorts of decisions in a, deliberate, in a deliberate manner. The critique which has been made about the, uh, the Eastern Partnership as being one of the causes of Putin's pushback in Ukraine six months ago, that critique is actually valid in terms of the pushback, but I don't think uh, that one can uh, imagine for one second that uh, Mr. Barroso was thinking strategically when he was working on the Eastern Partnership. If I'm wrong, that would mean that Barroso had an incredibly, uh, an incredible, not only an incredible hidden agenda, but it would also mean that he was, would have been an entirely reckless individual baiting the Russian bear deliberately without having the means to face him. Uh, I don't think he was doing that deliberately or that he, uh, uh, or that he was reckless enough to bait the uh, Russian bear without the means to deal with the Russian bear. Uh, no, this was a case where it would have made a lot more sense for the member states to have paid attention to what the institutions of the Union were bumbling into uh, at the time. So this is, in conclusion, one of the tricky aspects of where we are. We are sort of in the middle we have elements of EU action. The Eastern Partnership was an EU action. And yet, at the same time, the major receptacle and certainly the essential ve uh, vehicle in strategic terms remain the member states. Uh, and it's the combination of those two which can, which can lead to some very tricky decision making. But once again, we may have our problems. Uh, but when we look at our achievements, and they have been great, notwithstanding the crisis, uh, there, I think there is still a lot of fight in the old beast. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francois. Ricky. <clears throat> Francois, if you are comparing yourself to Yeltsin, then I start with comparing myself probably with Jeanne d'Arc, who was the women who heard voices, and then <laughs> I'm hearing voices about a fully united European Union and sometime soon and then I'm put into male inquisition of the Catholic Church who um, basically got it wrong in history because Jeanne d'Arc was bringing the French king to coronation and was ending the Hundred Years Wars if I'm not mistaken. So um, I think I'm not telling you the story that the EU or the Eurozone in this uh, existing situation is fine or doesn't have any flaws or problems or so. The thing is that the very interesting discussion that CSIS offered us to have for three days was many American counterparts. I guess the, the, the thing is, and to give you that one, that in terms of analysis, we, we, we are just, we, we, we are all on the same analysis. We know we made, fa we, 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 we knew that the euro was a political story. We know that it has flaws on the monetary side. We knew that the institutions are lacking behind. We knew that we didn't do what we did in all these, you know, deepening, widening exercises we had from Maastricht Treaty to Amsterdam to Nice to Lisbon and so on and so forth. Um, we, we know this. We also know that the European euro crisis had a biggest a disaster in our economies that basically everybody used the flaws in its own way, that the Germans did an export party and the South had a spending party and that we were basically dramatically um, uh, lacking a European executive which could
could have done the same sort of shortcuts like the US government did on the banks and so on and so forth. So we know this, yeah? So in these dis discussions where we are always forced, and I do no longer accept this framing, sort of less Europe, more Europe, and then uh, Francois is on the less side and I'm pretendingly on the more side. No, I'm not standing here to say you that I defend more of that same Europe. We know that this is a Europe that does not function, that doesn't fulfill basic needs of social Europe, which is not, uh, which is not able to convey the citizens' uh, vote to what people really want, uh, that this is a techno structure in which politics doesn't play of in which the parliament is refrained and so on and so on. So I'm not giving you that discourse yeah, in, 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 in that respect. But what I give you is then if you look at sort of the solutions and where we actually do divide, where I divide with Francois, where I potentially divide a little bit, but less I think with John and with the Brits that we have who give the lecture on the future as the nation state and so, where I honestly do divide is not on the analysis, but on what, do we, what comes next. And here I am with uh, Sisyphus which is you roll the stone, it comes down, you roll the stone, it comes down, you roll the stone, it comes down. Yeah? Now it's awfully coming down that European stone, we roll it up again, probably in a different way, just because history is always forward, not backwards, and looking backwards is Sodom and Gomorrah, and so it's not an option for me. And I tell you what, the moment the Eurozone should explode, or you exit the Greeks, or you exit the Italians of what I think will never happen on purpose, you will not see a European Council where Merkel and Hollande and Renzi sit down and say, look, this Euro was really bad, and it did this, and that, and therefore now we close the shop, uh, we close the banks for two weeks, and then let's get national currencies. It will not happen. It may happen, and I'm not naive about the really disastrous situation in Europe. It may happen by default. It may happen because we do not know an unknown risk, because we do not know how Ukraine will impact on our capacity to deal with it or whatever. Yeah. So it may happen by default, as everything in history happens by default. And the moment that that should happen, what I'm not wishing for, is the moment the day after of default in which then the real question is who picks the agenda? Is then the agenda going back to national sort of scenarios or do we have then smart people out there who say, okay, shit enough, the stall is coming back and it's now there and then we hopefully have enough smart people and I'm betting we do have enough smart people there who will say, look, Let's do Europe again. Needs to be different where the learning corp cannot be in the way we shaped it last time. We have a learning corp, we know what we know to do better, and now go on again. And I tell you what, we had Wolfgang Münch and other people on this panel where basically if you you know you you do all these scenario buildings, what you come up with is that's probably likely to happen. The moment it should explode or implode, you will probably see the Eurozone countries not giving up the Euro, most of them. You will probably hopefully have Poland joining and and then the question comes down to whether you exit Greece or Italy and then you think like, yes, that's a lot of work for not much because it's still expensive to exit this country, so why shouldn't you give them a debt memorandum? I mean, you know, if, if you really do these scenario buildings, you quickly come up to a situation where it, it, it will all be starting again unless we, we, we are in a situation of uh, completely uncontrolled. So, and that's why I stand here. And um, uh, I'm, I'm completely aware of the fact that we're in a catch-22, and the catch-22 is that the current system cannot deliver the solutions we need. That is the catch-22 we are in, because we are path dependingly only doing reforms at the margins, and these reforms at the margins are either ridiculous or do not help or do not improve the situation. And that is basically, again, the catch-22 situation uh, we are in, which is while in a Hegelian sense, uh, moving the whole system from synthesis to a new thesis would just be it, and probably you need at some point some systemic breakdown, which may appear, but you do not work for it. It's basically coming by default. I happen to, I give you this one, I happen to print it a little, little postcard, which basically most people like, and on it it's written, the European Republic is under construction. That's just a joke, but I place this in the internet, and what I get is lots of, lots of European citizens which are happy to find this, because it's not a blue flag which basically uh, uh, pushes everything down, but it's just a thing of ownership and we, the European people, and we the European citizens, which is, you know, Platon, Aristoteles, European res publica, which is the public good that we do need to organize together because the real country in brackets we are living in since long is called Euroland and not France and not Germany and not the Netherlands. It's Euroland on which we need, we need to build a different kind of democracy. And I'm, you, you may say I'm Jeanne d'Arc and I'm hearing these voices and I'm completely lunatic and that's basically what the Catholic Church did with Jeanne d'Arc. But, you know, if you want to have it more 
sort of uh, rational, there is a very current opinion poll, which I can send to you if you send me an email, and which basically exit the Swedes and the UK, which has a pretty lunatic discussion on Europe, by the way, exit Sweden and, and the UK, you get a more than 50% average of European people for either status quo or more integration or even federation. Even in Hungary, you have 23% of people who actually want the European Federation of Europe. Um, uh, in, in Germany, you have 25. Even in uh, uh, France, it's 21. Yeah? So, but, and then you add those who are for deep integration to those who are at least for the status quo. You have a 50% average and more of most European citizens who want this. So why, and Francois is right, this is not in the party programs of most parties, but why is this not articulating? And here, there's a very simple answer, which is the answer of Walter Hallstein, the first German commissioner, the answer of Churchill, the answer of the first American president who said when signing, I learned this in the conference, thank you, Heather, uh, when signing uh, uh, the NATO thing, the American president Truman said, I hope that this is just a preparation for European defense initiative and a truly bold Europe. So all these great people like Truman, Churchill, Hallstein, who have you, were always convinced there should that be that, that little union. And what they have in their speeches, if you read these speeches, is that little, little thing, let's abolish the nation state. The nation state, and I don't give you that excuse, but I can do hours of teaching on this. If there's one big flaw in how the European system actually works, is the nation state and is the council, is these overnight sessions where you have Hollande and Mercosy and whoever talking, and then you have a solution and say, crash down this solution. It's, it, it's opaque, it's not transparent, citizens cannot voice, uh, and so on and so forth. So there is, a, there is a, a very tricky, and I don't go into details, but uh, you know, look at current EU politics. 1.3 million citizens signed up for that water initiative, which means that water should not be uh, privatized, right? What is the council doing? The council is sucking this in because it's not pleasing. Why the system, the European system functions this? Because probably the water, and that's my fair bet, because the, on energy is the same thing. Most European citizens are for sustainable energy and the whole thing. But the lobby is done by EDF, Vattenfall, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and RWE, yeah? the big sort of monopolist on energy policy. And because these business lobbyists can so well work, both the parliament and the council and the commission, you end up having policies which basically are the opposite of what citizens want, but citizens cannot voice because the parliamentarian structure of the European Union is crap, and in an essence it's still the council, thus the nation states who are the biggest problem to citizens' will and to articulate citizens' will in Europe. So the moment you can overcome this, and that's not an easy little task, I'm, I'm, I'm very sort of modest here, yeah? but this Dismantling the euro is not an easy little task neither. So if I'm just choosing my sort of energy and where I place my energy, I am placing my energy still in that rhetoric that says that I need to overcome the current structure of the techno structure of the European Union to give citizens a voice to build a different kind, a different Europe, a different Euro Europe which is parliamentarian based, which has a strong Eurozone parliament. I'm talking Eurozone here. So I build a strong executive which would merge national MPs with MEPs, so the European legislative body with the national bodies, I get a cross legitimacy and have a strong legislative that controls a strong executive within the Eurozone. And then I get something that I could call a European democracy which is built on Montesquieu division of power rather than having a European parliament which has no right for initiative, which has no control of the budget, and which needs to spend all its energy to fight against the council to get the shitty lobby driven uh, 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 decisions of the council and to wipe them over. This is the mechanics of the European Union. And I will spend the rest energy I have for my 20 next professional lives to get that system towards a full-fledged European democracy. And this is the figure that helps me because I know that I have more than 50% of European people behind me. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and you can understand why we were having a lot of fun in Williamsburg. Okay, John, from an American perspective, put this into some perspective for us. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Well, I think my job here is, in fact, to translate all that into American English. Great. <laughs> uh, because uh, there was a lot of truth in there, but I'm not sure how much of it came out to you. Um, America and Europe, in whatever shape either has been, have been at odds with each other since the early 17th century. Uh, the Europeans resented that we were formed, at least the intellectuals did. There's immense amount of literature about how the intellectuals said this new America can't succeed. The very idea of a new world was already too much of a challenge for them. 
And this kind of friendly back and forth has gone on for 400 years and it will continue to go on because we are of the same cultural roots, as we always say, but the implications of what we have done um, with these cultural roots are the s source of this dialogue that we're in. As you probably know, um, a great percentage of Americans are actually of German origin, a very high percentage. And I sometimes say to my German friends, now America is what happens when you let Germans loose on a big continent, so be careful how much you criticize us. Um, but this misunderstanding was carried on or deepened in a way after World War II. Because after World War II, <clears throat> the Europeans were, shall we say, in a bit of a psychological low point, and the Americans were at a very psychological high point. And so the recipe for Europe was what else could it be, the United States of Europe? There's only one good form of government, as we know, and that's the United States. So they should have been the United States of Europe. And I believe that this misunderstanding, which started then, has carried us to this day. The basic misunderstanding is that in order to overcome the, the tragedies of the 20th century, to become modern, productive, democratic, et cetera, Europe somehow had to replicate the institutions of the United States, and Francois pointed that out. There was even a constitutional convention here a few years ago. The fact is that the institutions of the United States, as we know, were set up for a very specific situation uh, over 200 years ago, and they don't really have a lot of relevance either to the geographic and historical situation of Europe or the mentality of Europeans. American institutions were set up to stimulate controversy and even confrontation among the, 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 the uh, various branches of government. They were done on purpose that way. Europeans like consensus. They like d discussion, dialogue, agreement, and consensus. And so the job of adapting what post-war Europe became, which is something extremely positive and good, to this vision of a federal state sort of somehow uh, modeled on the United States has been very difficult, and as both of my previous speakers said, not totally successful. The first push towards this was, we know Winston Churchill talked about the United States of Europe already in 1946, but then maybe not too many of you remember that the entire administration of the Marshall Plan was done on the basis of an organization called the OEEC, which later was the OECD, whose job it was to come up with a common European economic project for the future. This was an American requirement for giving the money. In 1949, when Harry Truman signed the NATO Treaty, in the White House here, he made a statement, which you can read in any archive, when he said, I'm signing this treaty on the understanding that the United States is committing itself to European defense as a basis for the, for the establishment of a European Union of States. In other words, um, be us and we'll defend you. And so, and then the misunderstandings continued, continued, continued. And the result, after all, has been one of the most successful, most democratic, most prosperous bits of international cooperation in all of history. If you look at what Europe was in 1945, look what the American view of the world was in 1945, and compare it to today, you can only say it's been an amazing, wonderful success, and we should all be thrilled by it. The problem is that, as we know, history never stands still. And so the mentality and the institutions which led to this success are now very much under strain. The United States is having a very hard time adjusting to whatever we want to call it, a multipolar world or a, a multi-centered world, whatever the world is. We're just having a lot of trouble dealing with it. Our, re our reaction has been to go out and find enemies and shoot them dead so they won't bother us anymore. But that's not going to work. And what we have done is given up the constant management together with our European friends of this continent, Europe, 
which in reality is only 25 years into its recovery from probably the worst series of wars that the continent had, had, had anybody had, had experienced in a long time. And as they call sometimes, they call it a near-death experience in 1945. The idea that all this was solved with the fall of the Soviet Union is probably one of the biggest illusions which anyone ever had. The, as we see now, as Mr. Putin has warned us, showed us, the putting together of the European project is going to be another half century at least. And it will not work unless the United States plays its role and you know, Europeans play their roles, but do it on a basis of what the world is now today and not of 1945, and that is a bit our problem. The previous group, a couple of them said, Roger said, and I think, um, um, I don't know if Gideon did or not, but um, that uh, U.S.-European relations are at one of their low points. Well, if you, if, you, if you analyze it according to 1945, you might argue that. But I have three numbers which I wrote down which de describe a different kind of relationship. The numbers are 40,000, 60,000, 90,000. Those are respectively the number of French, British, and German engineers and information technology specialists who work in California. Uh, the Atlantic is being unified more rapidly than any of us know at various levels. The trouble is that governments aren't playing much of a role in this. And when they do, they tend to mess it up, like in the NSA scandal. And so um, it's very hard for everyone, and I include myself very much in that group of everyone, to try and get a handle on what's really happening. The Articles of Confederation example is probably good because what uh, Ulrike in particular said, but Francois suggested also, the requirements of the 21st century cannot be met by the structures of the European Union. They can hardly be met maybe by the structures of the United States government, but we're a little bit more flexible. Uh, to take the Euro crisis started in 2010, this is now 2014, and to the outside observer, again, Europeans would state this isn't true, but to the outside observer, it looks like about what has happened since 2010 is several dozen, maybe several hundred meetings, each which came out with a communique which said there's going to be another meeting to take another step towards a solution which has not yet been described. Now, again, the Europeans would say that's a stupid American way of looking at it, but that's the way we see it. It took us about six months in the fall of 2008 and the spring of 2009 to come up with a program to deal with the fall of the Lehman Bank and all the all the unbelievable, horrible consequences which came out of the uh, the mortgage uh, problems. It took us about six months, and so far after that, our economy has been on a generally positive upward track. And I don't have the figures in my head, but we're growing two and a half, three, three and a half percent, something like that. In Germany, the press trumpets success if they make it over 1% of growth. And Francois said it very um, clearly, the, 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 the um, consequences of what's going on. Uh, the, str the structure simply won't work anymore. That's the real story. And our structure of viewing with the world isn't going to work anymore either. So we have a joint project here, which is to overcome our backward-looking views of the world. I, I found this quote from Mr. Steinmeier, who's the German foreign minister, as you all know, which illustrates what I'm talking about. He wrote this in an article marking the 100th anniversary of World War I. And he said, many seem to find the long search for compromise at the Brussels negotiating table to be too difficult, too boring, and too stagnant. But in this anniversary year, it is vital to appreciate what a leap of civilization this method represents. As what committee is a leap of civilization. When large and small member states who opposed each other um, in countless wars on this continent today debate through long nights 
in a peaceful and civilized search for common solutions. Now, this is what Mr. Steinmeier wrote to celebrate the European Union. For most Americans, that would be a recipe for a nap. And um, I'm not trying to be sarcastic here. This is our problem. We see Europe, which is based on ideas that we gave them, as struggling towards a nap. And they see us, based on a civilization which they gave us, as heading towards some kind of uh, civilizational catastrophe. Uh, that's not the best basis for dialogue. And I don't believe that the president and his colleagues will take this issue on the next week when he sees them. But I do believe that for the CSIS and for groups like all of us who are trying to understand this, it's very interesting to look at it from this perspective rather from all the details of what NATO is doing. Because in the end, we have this wonderful accomplishment which has, has put the world in a position of more freedom and more prosperity than anybody could ever have expected, even 50 years ago. And um, we're in danger of losing it if we don't start changing gears and looking into the future. Thank you. And that was the beauty of the last three days. Um, I'm going to give you a chance to think, think some questions. <coughs> There's such richness here and, and, and a, a wide-ranging set of issues. So I'm going to I'm going to try to drill down and be a little more specific. Um, so John, you 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 gave us the challenge of how we've the United States has given up its constant management of Europe. Europe is only 25 years old and thinking through the Europe today after German reunification. Help give me the contours of what a new management plan would look like, a transatlantic management plan. Uh, for Europe. And I guess I would offer sort of the reflection from the other side to Francois and Ulrike. What would be a new <coughs> management plan that Europe would see as its approach to the United States? Mm -hmm. uh, we have been now given this new geostrategic moment, which almost forces us to be backward looking because we can fall back into old patterns of behavior, but in such a new setting, which you all three have, have articulated. How do we overcome these obstacles and put ourselves in a new, uh, in a new place, in a new level of dialogue? I don't know if President Obama can even scratch the surface of this, but I'm hoping that there's some really big thinking happening at the State Department, uh, in the White House, uh, to, to think through and capture some of that. So that's my question for our panelists. I'll let you think now. Let's uh, bring you into the conversation. I'm so glad we see some hands going up. So I have two right here. Again, please identify yourself. Uh, and uh, you're going to have to speak very strongly into that microphone. Sometimes we have a hard time hearing you. Thank you. Okay, so my name is Bartosz Szydliński. I'm uh, from Alexander Kwasiński Foundation from Poland. Uh, so I would like to ask about the 25th of May, but not, not only in Europe, but also in Euro the European Union, but also in the Ukraine. So should United States and the European Union help to prepare the presidential elections in Ukraine, especially in Crimea? Because what do you think about a situation when the presidential election will not take place in the Crimea? This means that the Crimea is already lost. Uh, we dis you discuss about the anti-European powers, uh, which will take a uh, big position in the new European Parliament, <coughs> but we must probably agree that this is our European Union fault, because from the very beginning in the European Parliament, there is a big coalition, so it doesn't matter if you vote for Social Democrats or Christian Democrats, you have the same result of the politics, the same bureaucratic language that probably only bureaucrats from Strasbourg and Brussels can understand. So I think that, in my opinion, this is very good that the anti-European parties will go to the European Parliament, because all political parties in the European Parliament must make the normal struggle fight, normal struggle in the political decision-making process involving also society. Because it is confusing that me as a Pole, is problem to, I have problem to go to the European Parliament to visit my members of Parliament, and I don't have any problem to visit even congressmen in the United States. I, just a one side note before you hand the microphone over. That was the exact question we asked during our conference about are, are they, what are they voting for if they're voting for the same thing? If the voters vote for change, how do they express that change? I want, I want to tell you, we, we and, and analyze that question exactly as you posed it. Yes, sir. Again, Konstantinos Kanalopoulos from American University and the Transatlantic Academy. Um, on the same note in the European elections, 
Um, don't you think that it's an imperative that for the EU to combat the euro skepticism that we see in countries such as my own country, Greece, and the, the existential crisis that the EU is suffering from, that it tackles the democratic deficit? Don't you think that the EU needs more democratic cement to hold itself together? Whilst we're, don't, we should not underestimate the importance of the European Parliament elections this May, it's still a fact that it's the European elections are more like 28 different elections that are solely based on national issues instead of European issues that predominate the campaigns accordingly. Is it essential that we have a pan-European political campaigns and we have the president of the European Commission, no matter what the difficulties of that would be, to be directly elected from the European people? And then thirdly, how do we move on from this crisis to illustrate that centralization and federalization are the solutions to this crisis? And how do we sell the European project to people like myself, European youth from the ages of 18 to 25, in countries like Greece suffering with almost 60% of unemployment, that Europe is more of a part of the solution than a part of the problem? Thank you. Wonderful. Do we have a, we have a question right in the back, please? Hello, uh, I'm uh, Mike Dorning with Bloomberg News. I'm curious what the panelists, particularly um, the former Assistant Secretary of State, think that President Obama can get done in terms of a response to the Ukrainian, uh, the challenge of Russia and Ukraine and Crimea. Where do the European interests and the American interests diverge and what's the path this week to shaping a cohesive response, or, or can there really be one? Well, why don't we uh, take those, uh, those, those several questions, and uh, we can just go in original order. And I, I want to pose a question. Uh, Wolfgang Munchau was with us uh, from your intelligence. If, if you don't mind, when we're done answering questions, I'd like to turn the microphone to you, and if you don't mind offering some f reflections on the uh, the decision that came out this morning on banking union. I just, uh, I, if I want to give you time to not surprise you, if you don't mind uh, doing that, I'll introduce you formally then. Uh, uh, actually, there, there are three questions, including your own, which are highly converging, uh, mm -hmm. because you cannot answer the question about US-EU relations without uh, raising the issue of the big crisis, which uh, we have just entered into and which is a game-changing crisis. Uh, uh, we will have to consider in the future uh, Russia, Vladimir Putin's Russia as being an antagonist power. Uh, uh, I don't call this new Cold War because with the ideological component, as is often noted, is not there. Uh, uh, but uh, certainly Russia is determined to play by rules which are no longer those which it had been adhering to at least uh, giving lip service to over the last few years. Annexation of other people's territory is now considered as kosher conduct uh, by Russia. And that is something which is at 180 degrees from the European vision and from the American vision. So this is the crisis which forces us to act together and it is the, cri and it is the crisis which will give the biggest content uh, to our relations. So how do we deal with that in a US-EU framework? Uh, at several levels. The first one, of course, is to help Ukraine and its government in Kiev uh, to become functional uh, economically and politically. The emergency financial and economic package with the, a key role for the IMF, but also, of course, for the European uh, Union. Uh, if that government, after the elections on the 25th of May, uh, cannot get itself into uh, a somewhat better order than the governments we have seen in Ukraine since independence uh, uh, 22 years ago, uh, 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 it is going to become very, very difficult. Uh, uh, and we may not have much time, and the folks in Kiev may not have much time, uh, to get their act together 
uh, given uh, uh, some of the indications which have been coming out from the White House over the last uh, few minutes about worries about Russian troop movements uh, in, uh, around the east and the south of the Ukraine. Uh, uh, item A, and that item A may include providing the Ukrainian government with the means to ensure its self-defense. Not simply meals ready to eat, as somebody uh, said earlier this morning here in this room, uh, but we are going to have to think very hard in Europe, in the US, as to how we're going to respond to the legitimate Ukrainian government, legitimate request to have the wherewithal to defend itself. B, item B, US and Europe together in order to limit their vulnerability vis-a-vis -vis Russia. And that means two things. One, energy. You have on the table in the States the issue of, are you going to export hydrocarbons or not? And the Europeans have on their table, are we going to stop our silliness about shutting down existing sources of production of energy, nuclear energy in Germany, and preventing ourselves from exploring new sources of energy like unconventional gas. Uh, there, this, I understand, will be a significant element of the EU-US summit. Uh, this is truly of the essence if over the next two years we want to unbuild the strategic dependency of Europe on Russian gas, and notably the dependency of Poland, if I may say so which is where the country which I think is, along with Bulgaria, I think the most dependent uh, in, this, uh, in this respect. Thirdly, we have to build up the credibility of our capability of defense. Article 5 is of the essence. It would be nice to have our heads, and, heads of state and government say that together and not wait for the summit, NATO summit, next May to do that because events are going to go much more quickly than that. And there are, as everybody knows, more Russians, Russian speakers, in Latvia, proportionate to the population, uh, than there are in the eastern Ukraine. And as we all know, President Putin considers that he has a droit de regard on the fate of Russian speakers outside of his own borders, a little bit as if France considered that it had a duty to intervene in Belgium or in Switzerland when French speakers are in trouble with their German-speaking or their Dutch-speaking uh, brethren. Uh, this is the new world in which we are, uh, in which we are uh, entering. Uh, on the other question, uh, about uh, the European Parliament. Uh, I am a federalist. That is, I would not have minded at all if the European Constitutional Treaty in 2005 had been put to a single constituency referendum in the whole of Europe. That, that is a test of whether you, you're a federalist or not. Are you ready to contemplate that? Are you ready to contemplate the creation of the European demos? Our countries were not ready to do that at the time. They didn't. I think it was a mistake. Uh, but this is the test. There is no European demos. There is no European people, in the sense that you are French people or an American people, at least not today. And therefore, you do not have bona fide political parties in the European Parliament not in the sense that you have political parties at the, national, at the national level. That is not, unfortunately, going to uh, change uh, any time soon. And why? Because you, know, you have in a number of European countries youth unemployment which has exceeded 50%. 50% the youth unemployment in Spain, and more than 50% in Greece and Spain. Countries where you have unemployment levels which are highly above 15%, 28% in Greece, 25% in Spain, etc., etc. Now you're going to tell those people, oh, uh, given the fantastic track record of our European institutions and of our national governments since 2007, we're going to give even more power to the folks in the European institutions. 
I have not yet met a, a, a politician who is ready to step on the soapbox and say something of that sort, because of course that person would not stay on the soapbox for very long. Uh, soapbox would be removed from under the feet quite quickly, uh, which is why I am an Augustinian Federalist. You know, Lord, give me chastity, but not straight away. But in this case, <laughs> in this case, it's it's the Lord who is the problem, and not Saint Augustine. <laughs> Well, I'm going to concentrate only on the use questions on democracy. I think that's precisely what I said. I mean, I'm not against the anti-European parties. I can perfectly understand them, right? Um, the, if you don't have reversibility in the system and you don't have sort of structured opposition in the system and you have basically no choice, then always get the same policy. You can vote who you want, you know, uh, um, uh, but you can't change the policy, which is what we did in Greece, which is basically we were preventing a referendum. Then the only uh, choice you have, if you're not happy, you go uh, anti-system opposition. And that's what Marine Le Pen does and IFD does, Alternative für Deutschland. This is what Syriza does and so on and so forth. So yes, so, but what does it tell us? And here we need to be careful, yeah? It does not necessarily mean, and then you go back to polling, that people are anti-European, nor are they in average anti-Euro. But what they do want is opposition and reversibility within the system, and that comes precisely back to what I said, which is a parliamentarian, full-fledged structure, legislative controlling an executive body, which is Montesquieu division of power and not a nasty, intransparent, opaque council driven, not only by national interest, but even worth by lobby interest of national countries, yeah? And this is what gets European Union really wrong. So, uh, now you go down. The IFD is basically in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a state of dismantlement because they're hijacked by fascistic, fascistic uh, sort of tendencies, and uh, luckily so in a way. Uh, Beppe Grillo is going down because Renzi is the alternative. Beppe Grillo was never really populist, but really anti-establishment. And now that you have a sm smart 39-year-old uh, uh, anti-establishment uh, alternative to Beppe Grillo, hopes are that in Italy it comes down. If I may, you give that little footnote. The Italian movement um, uh, uh, for European Union picked up my little republic idea and just sent a week ago a letter to Renzi uh, uh, for uh, European Republic of Europe. So this is already in the lap of Renzi, and perhaps we have the young European 39 or the leader that we are all waiting for there and the name of the European leaders, not Merkel nor Hollande or whatever. So you go down, uh, I think Wilders is a real problem, the, day, the, the Dutch are a problem. They are not a problem on the Euro. The Dutch are actually pretty happy with the Euro, but they are unhappy with this migration thing and it's, it's unfortunate that this... Uh, uh, True Finns is, if you look at sociology, is a very old sort of uh, old white man over 60 uh, uh, losing their legacy sort of party in terms of sociology. If I may say this, this is pretty true for most of the um, sociologies of uh, right-wing uh, parties, which is, uh, to be very blunt and sorry, but it's more or less male, old, and losing legacy parties. And so what I want to point to is if we want that thing happen, which is parliamentarization of the system, so what I am building strongly on is just generational shift of the whole discussion. The whole European discourse is completely dominated. I can give you pictures from the Munich Security Conference. That's not even o over 60 that's over 80, if I may say so, and it's completely male-dominant. So the, the, what I'm saying here is that the current European discussion is not reflecting the current gender dynamics, and because it's not reflecting gender dynamics, it's not reflecting what is happening in the internet, cyber, digital revolution, and all these websites which are out there. I have, you know, go to my Twitter account, all these youngsters building websites for Europe and so on and so forth. So the gender dynamic and the generational dynamics of this discussion is not reflected, and it and, and Therefore, it is why these populist parties, you know, which I'm, as I said, not against in the first place because they have a very fair point, um, but it's not giving a true picture but because it seems as if everybody's against Europe, but it's actually not the case. I gave you my sort of citizen based uh, polling here, and if you price the gender dynamics in, you get probably still very different fix, uh, fixtures, so, uh, figures. So, I mean, uh, to, to make a long story short, screw the system, save the idea is probably what we need to do in, in whatever form. And, uh, uh, chances are hopefully out there that we succeed. Power to youth. John. Um, well, first, I'll go to your question, if I may. What should we do next? Um, what we, I think what we shouldn't do next is try to come up with great new institutional um, 
solutions because I think we are beyond institutional solutions. I think we need to identify what we need to get done. And I'll start with the United States. What the United States needs to get done more than anything else is to remember that it is, so to speak, the, the managing partner of the world, not just of the Atlantic world, but of the world, and has to do what I was taught to do over 40 years of diplomacy, that is to work every day to keep the structures going. This is what we did between 1945 and 1995 or 2000. And that, that vocation has been lost. We don't do that anymore. And you just have to see the way both the Bush and Obama administrations related to Europe to see in our most central relationship, uh, this day-to-day -day management has simply been ignored. Part, there are a lot of reasons I won't go into them, but the president's pivot towards Asia is a good example. As if we'd never been involved in Asia, I think there's something called the Vietnam War, which, uh, which uh, was quite an engagement in the Arab, or maybe there was World War II. We were in, in Asia right up to our necks. But uh, somehow, for whatever reason, uh, people, and I, I can tell you, I hear this from endless numbers of Americans who come to Europe. Even the president of the August Council in Foreign Relations wrote an article a year or so ago saying Europe was irrelevant to the United States. Our own political system has gone awry. If that's the way we're going to protect our foreign interests, we got to start all over again. Maybe we should join the European Union and have a joint constitutional convention. I don't know. <laughs> We've got to start all over again. On the other hand, the Europeans got so deeply involved in their institutions that they also forgot their interests. One of the main ones that they sacrificed, really for nothing, without even thinking, was the strategic link with the United States. Until 1990, Europe was the most strategic point on Earth and it had the entire loyalty and engagement of the world's greatest military power, the United States. Once the Cold War ended, that central position was no longer there. What did the Europeans do? Instead of coming and trying to work out a new strategic relationship with the United States, they decided they were going to go into their own clubhouse, the European Union, and build up something which is now called the current foreign and security policy which is neither foreign nor to security nor is it a policy, but it, 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 it had the effect of breaking the link with the United States. And I can say, I'm not involved in it anymore, but I certainly have enough contact, that link is now gone. The United States does not see its strategic interests as being involved in Europe. Maybe Mr. Putin has reinstated it for us, but it, up until recently it was gone. Uh, on other points, and that's what I would do, I would start talking about common agendas whether the heads of government do it, whether we need a wise man's commission. We had a wise man's commission after the Berlin Wall went up called the Harmel Commission, which actually devised detente policy and actually took us towards the end of the Cold War. So wise men's commissions do work sometimes. Whatever it is, we need to have an agenda. We need to know what we're talking about. Some of the things that Francois mentioned are exactly right. We need to understand what we're doing about energy. On the other hand, the Shell Corporation has just at least said uh, before the trouble started, they were going to invest $5 billion, no, $500 billion in Ukraine to develop shale gas. So maybe that's underway. But we need to have an agenda and we need to know how to work it. More than that, I don't know what to say. Uh, on the question of federalism, well, you would take from my comments, I do not believe European federalism is the right future for Europe. I think it's a, it's a dead end. Europe is a beautiful, wonderful, diverse place which doesn't have the push towards a, a federalism which the United States had. And we got, as uh, Francois and others were saying, we got a wonderful description of American federalism from Professor Wood down in, in Williamsburg. And let's not forget that American federalism has been a fight from the beginning to the end. And we had a civil war in the middle, which is still the worst war the United States was ever involved in. And uh, you don't want to take our route to federalism, let's put it that way. I think that in the new world that's coming up, the globally integrated world, Europe's going to have a great opportunity because it's not federal, because these individual states can, in fact, work together on a different level. But it's going to take a while. As I said, I apologize. We sold you all of our institutions, and you shouldn't have bought them. But there you go. But I think that the world will evolve into something else. 
Uh, now, I'm, I'm going to have another round of questions, I promise, but I, I can't pass up the, the opportunity. Uh, Wolfgang Munchau, um, co-founder of Euro Intelligence uh, and also a columnist for the Financial Times, has been with us in Williamsburg. And I just thought, if I may put you on the spot, please forgive me, just a few thoughts on, on the economics of, of Europe very specifically or any comments that you have on this morning's 7 a.m. decision on banking unions. So, Wolfgang, thank you. And then we'll take another question quick round. Heather, thank you very much. Yeah, I was, I was following it uh, on Twitter this morning and uh, <laughs> sort of at 4 a.m. local time there were various tweets of saying we've been negotiating for 11 hours, no deal. Then I got the 14 hour uh, tweet, no deal, and then suddenly it's sort of after 16 or 17 hours they finally got a deal. Um, it's in many respects a very, a very, a very European deal. Just for your background, the issue is the European equivalent of a federal deposit and insurance corporation to backstop the banking sector. Um, the, in the way the Europeans do these things, first the ministers agreed it, they did this in December, so if you thought you saw that headline before, banking union agreed, that happened in December, but in Europe these things have to be agreed <laughs> twice. So they, uh, the European Parliament has uh, co-decision rights here, so basically they have to agree to it as well. And there was a, a very big conference last night in which the Council, the Commission and the Parliament, the three main institutions of the EU, all sat together and negotiated the final details. The main weakness of the agreement in December, and you know, you could ask different people and they give you different lists of weaknesses and strengths of that agreement, was that unlike the FDIC, it was not backstopped by any uh, you know, government money. The fund for, the, for this European FDIC, which we call the Single Resolution Mechanism, is about, in dollar terms, about 60, 70 billion dollars. That's enough to handle a failure of one bank, two banks maybe. You couldn't handle Deutsche Bank. That's already too large for, the, for this mechanism. But you could probably handle a couple of medium-sized banks. So this is useful for a situation when the bank manager runs away with the money. It's not really useful for, for a systemic financial crisis of the kind we had. So this is not really a, you know, a big macroeconomic stabilization mechanism, the one that was agreed, because the fund itself has no backstop. The FDIC, by contrast, is backstopped, is indirectly backstopped by the U.S. government. If the FDIC failed, there is no doubt in anybody's mind that the U.S. government would, would step in. That situation can, does not exist in Europe because we don't have a European government, so the question of a backstop was, was important. When I spoke to a very, to a very senior uh, a leader of the European Parliament, he told me that this was really the only issue, the fact that this fund is backstopped, he had telephoned with Angela Merkel and she told him that there's under no way that Germany would accept a backstop because that's sort of a, a way to common funding, about the, sort, of a, sort of a roundabout way to a euro bond, which is what the Germans have, have rejected. And he's, you know, the, the question that they have been asking themselves in the parliament, should we block it over that? Should we, should we boycott this whole, whole legislation uh, because of this um, funding mechanism? And the, the ultimate reason they ended up not boycotting this legislation this morning was political. They are, there is an election uh, to the European Parliament in two months' time. If they had boycotted it now, the uh, various parties that boycotted it, in particular the Socialists, would have come under attack for wrecking, the, wrecking, the, wrecking this agreement. And it could, have, it could have led to financial market panic. I don't know, nobody really would have known this, but there is a risk that, a, that the Euro crisis might have returned, even briefly, and the parliament would have been, been attacked. Now with the Russian situation also overhanging, uh, dominating the debate, I don't think anybody wanted to open this, so they basically closed it down. Now the way they did this technically is quite, quite instructive of how to, how, to, how, to, how to actually do this. Now they've, they've, they've agreed internally that the only issue was this back of funding, but, but in order to make it look better, to them look better, they, they put up five or six different points on which they disagreed fundamentally. There were procedural issues into which I don't want to go because they are too, too tedious to, to discuss uh, who takes decisions at what times and, and, and you know, who's going to call whom. At, and, at, at, you know, this all has to happen in a, over a weekend. The original proposal had 121 
uh, people involved in this decision and about six or seven committees uh, all this over a weekend, uh, that, you know, this is an impossible, I mean, the whole purpose of this bank resolution mechanism would have been not to resolve a single bank. Um, uh, they have fixed that a little bit, but they didn't get any, any, any deal on the, on the single, on the, on the, back, on the backstop. So they, the European Parliament declared victory on, on a number of procedural issues, and it sounded pretty good, and, you know, having 16 hours of negotiations without sleep is pretty impressive. <laughs> Um, uh, but in substance, this is the minister's proposal in essence. Wolfgang Schäuble, the German fun finance minister, he was woken up at six o'clock uh, in the morning. He's been really tough in these negotiations and he, he, you know, he had no problems agreeing to that, to that agreement, to that deal. It wasn't you know, the, the small concessions that they made. Um, you know, the fund is now going to be built up a little faster and with a different formula. So these 55 billion euros, 70 billion dollars, they're going to be replenished a little, a little differently than the, in the original proposal. There's a lot of small sprints stuff that's different, but ultimately, you know, this is the the, the same old weak bank resolution mechanism. It it may eventually. And this is what I'm going to close here. Eventually, we will have <coughs> a banking union in in the EU. My guess is it will be about 20 to 30 years from now. Um, uh, it will not ha affect this current crisis. So if you think that the banks have you know, need to be restructured, which, which they will need to be, you know, this bank resolution mechanism will not, is not there for this particular resolution. This is for the next crisis, not for this one. And they acknowledge that. That's not sort of a, a commentator, cynical, cynical position. The whole idea of the, of the lack of a backstop is not to use this fund funding mechanism to sort out the current banking mess, what, what the Germans called legacy debt, which means Existing debt. That's what it is. Legacy debt. It's the debt we have. What we have now. This is about the debt. The debt we're going to have uh, in the next crisis. So you know, it's it, in that sense of a rather theoretical procedure. It's a structural response to a, a very cyclical problem. You heard it here first, guys. That was a great explanation. Well, thank you. I'm going to have you pass the microphone right behind you, Mike. You have literally 10 seconds, and you get to These pick your These last two person. comments have raised a fundamental question: How can you have a common currency? without a federal government. The U.S. has the national treasury to move money from New York to Alabama. Uh, nothing like that exists in Europe. You have a weak central bank. You're now talking about a weak uh, FDIC 20 years from now. How does this common currency keep going without these kind of props? Yeah, go, 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 go very quickly. I mean, you've put your, you've put your finger on the, the sorest of the points, and quite rightly so. Uh, uh, this, this, this currency was fated not to work, and when a storm occurred in 2007, 2008, it very rapidly demonstrated that it did not work, at least not to accomplish what it was supposed to accomplish, that is, stability. Instead of stability, we've had the great divergence of interest rates uh, within, the, within the Eurozone, uh, with Greece at 75%, I think, at one stage, and Germany at 1.5. Uh, it certainly did not bring, it did, certainly did not help promote growth, uh, uh, rather the opposite. Uh, uh, some of the Eurozone countries have uh, witnessed the, the longest recession industrialized countries have ever been through in peacetime including the Great Depression, by the way. Uh, six years with, without any growth is, a, you know, it takes a certain talent to do that. Uh, and that is what we got with the, uh, that is what we got uh, with, the, uh, with the Euro. Now, Mario Draghi has bought us some time. The currency is not going to explode all of a sudden. Uh, the way it nearly exploded several times in 2010, 2011, 2012, early 2013. Uh, we may have several years in front of us in order to try to set things right. Now here is where there are great differences of opinion. I believe, like you, that only a federal solution could actually allow the euro to operate in what would then be an optimal currency area. But since federalism is not going to be on offer any sooner than the banking union, which Wolfgang Münchau has promised us for uh, some time when I will no longer be in a position to ask myself questions about chastity, <laughs> 20 to 30 years, I think you said. Uh, uh, 
uh, therefore, the euro is going to have to go, and there are several ways in which you can try to do that. I offer one. Wolfgang has another, by the way, uh, if, uh, which he can talk about if you want to. Uh, uh, and others consider that we can do, continue to do what is called muddling through, uh, but which really is muddling down. That is, while the rest of the world will continue to grow, Europe will continue uh, to grow much less than it could be growing. I want to, uh, I'm so sorry, we are, we are so past time, but uh, come up and see you, Ricky. She's got some really good ideas. I want to, uh, first of all, thank our three panelists. That was a fabulous discussion. And again, it, it demonstrates that we need, uh, we need thought leaders to help us through this, uh, this important period. I thank you so much. We're going to resend out to you. We had two incredible live webcasts uh, of two events in Williamsburg, a live debate between Jorgas Musen, uh, the Deputy Minister of Labor in the German government in his private capacity, and Liam Fox, former uh, British Defense Minister, on for and against the proposition of the United States of Europe. It, and Roger Cohen moderated, it's worth the watch, as well as an economics discussion which featured Wolfgang. We will send those out to you. They were uh, important bits from Williamsburg. Again, our great gratitude to the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, the College of William and Mary, and our participants who made a fantastic conversation about the future of Europe, in some ways the future of the West as we watch the events in Crimea take place and in Ukraine. I thank you all for joining us. Have a great day and come back to CSIS soon. Thank you. Thank you.